And what we uh, conclude the day by doing at this workshop now is letting you be active. Uh, for those of you who are coming in, join a group, and if you have other people from your university here, sit with them, as opposed to other sessions where you don't sit with them. So what we have you do here is to consolidate your understanding of some of the important standards by practicing the self-evaluation. So using the standards is the basis of the self-evaluation. So uh, so we familiarize we with the content, description, and rationale associated with the standards and practice the process of self-evaluation. So just a reminder of the goals, deeper working knowledge, leading the creation and operation of new products and systems, the vision, and this vision now translates uh, into the approaches. I don't think I've shown you this slide today. The first standard context, the second standard learning outcomes, the next standard learning plans and activities, standards three to eight, skills and evaluation, standards nine to 12, and the change process, and we're helping you a little with the change process, including good practice, scholarship, sharing, and co-development. So this scholarship and good practice have been incorporated very explicitly into these standards. We, we developed the standards based on an understanding of what we were doing and why it was working or not working. That is to say the, the eight or so universities that were in the program at the time we drafted the standards. And also an understanding of the underlying scholarship of learning. So the, the, the CDIO standards are guides to effective practice based on, as we said, benchmarking, scholarship and learning, and developments that our member universities have done. And they can be used for a number of things. They can provide guidance in program design. You know, we need to teach these things, now how shall we teach them? They can be, provide the basis of periodic self-examination and I've separated these two because I think these are the two most important ones. And particularly this idea of periodic self-evaluation. You know, it's very easy in a university to just sort of think that you've got it right and then go off and work on other things. And what I notice, at least at my university, is you, you put some attention on education for a few years and then you go off to work on a new building or a new research program and you come back and things have sort of unwound a little bit in the education. It takes energy to keep an educational system running well. So that, that sort of periodic self advantage Now, in addition, you can use it for organizing activities. You can provide frameworks for discussion and co-development. Those are, I would say, s other benefits of the standards. But the, the top two are really the most important one. So here are all 12 of the standards. Now, at the beginning of the day, we had a handout that listed all of them in, in their full detail which I hope most of you still have in your hand because there aren't any more copies in the back of the room. So pull that out if you have it. And if you don't, I hope you can look on with someone else. And I'm not, certainly not gonna read all of this. It takes about eight pages to describe all the standards, but they are as follows. The first one says that you should choose the product process and system building skills uh, system building as the authentic context of the education. I talked about that in the first session this morning. The second one says you should select outcomes for the broad range of learning uh, consistent with stakeholder input. We talked about that. Christina talked about the integrated curriculum, a curriculum designed with mutually supporting disciplinary subjects. Uh, we, we probably did not today talk about an introduction in engineering. We found that one of the things that characterizes many good programs is they have a really exciting, engaging introduction subject in the first year. The design build experiences we just had the session on and complementing that is the workspaces that it, it, it's nice to have spaces in which the students can take possession of their learning and really build a, an environment that uh, they feel they own. That's a very supporting thing. Uh, integrated learning experiences, the idea that we should be teaching the skills along with the technical subjects as opposed to saying 
ethics is important, go over there and learn it, which is a way of signaling to the students that I don't want to be bothered with it. That, that comes through very clear. Active learning, there was a session on. Uh, and, and, and then there are two things that have to do with faculty competence of CDIO skills and teaching skills. Then there's the assessment of the student learning and the program evaluation. And if we were all doing all of these things well, boy, our education would be running very smoothly. And the fact of the matter is that none of us, uh, and we take evidence of this every few years, none of us are doing all these things perfectly. We could all improve in some or another aspects of this. So for each of the standards in this document you're looking at, there is the wording of the standard itself. But typically when you write 30 or 40 words about something, everyone says, well, what did you mean by this? So then there's about a half a page of text which just describes in more words what the standard means. That's what we call the description. And then there's a rationale why this is important a brief rationale for the standard. That, that, that's enough information to sort of explain to you what the standard is and why it's important. But when you want to turn it into an evaluation tool, it's useful to have a set of rubrics for self-evaluation. And by the way, there is nothing but self-evaluation. There's no CDIO inspection team that shows up to, to rate another program like national evaluation systems. So for each of the 12 standards, there's a set of six rubrics. There's a generic template, and it's specialized for each of the 12 standards. And the rubrics suggest the type of evidence that would be back, back up for the rankings. And then in addition, there's a separate document, and these are available online. There's a separate document which lists typical evidence that CDIO programs have submitted or have referenced. Uh, to, to give the, uh, to, to back up their, uh, their self-evaluation. So here is the generic rubric. It starts at zero. There is no documented plan or activity relative to the standard. Zero. Right? No activity, no plan. One, there's an awareness of the need to adopt the standard and a process in place to move forward. So, you know, when you're, when you're bringing about a human change process, it's very important to motivate people by the need to do it. Right? So that gets you a one. There's a plan in place to address it. You know, we're having workshops, we're having seminars, we have a draft, something like that. Implementation of the plan is underway, recognizing that often at a university it takes several years to fully change something. There, number four is there is documented evidence of the full implementation. That is to say, you've succeeded in implementing it. And standard number five is not only have you succeeded, uh, rubric number five is not only have you succeeded in implementing it, but in addition, you're now undergoing periodic review with the appropriate stakeholders to make sure that you continue to do a good process. So each is hierarchic, so each one implies that the things below it have been met as well. So here is standard three, and let me uh, get the text of standard three here. Standard three, just as an example, uh, is one that uh, Christina talked about earlier today. To create a mutually supportive disciplinary courses, integrating personal, Professional and, product, professional and product process system building skills. It's to create the integrated curriculum. So if you were to look at the rubrics, a zero is there is no significant integration of skills or mutually supporting disciplines in the program. Basically, you have stovepipes of disciplines. Number one, I'm reading the right-hand column, is there's a need to analyze, the, the need to analyze the curriculum is recognized and there's an initial mapping going on. Number two, there's a curriculum plan in place. Number three is it's been integrated into one or more years. Number four is it's addressed in all courses. 
and number five, it's regularly reviewed. So this type of model is called sometimes a capability maturity model. It's how mature are you in this task. This, task, this one happens to be building an integrated curriculum. So here is some sample evidence. We do this about every three years. And in, in fact, this was done as a test case to see how, it, how valuable these new rubrics that have been developed in the last year or so were. So three universities volunteered to be test cases. Ling Sherping was one of the original four schools and has been doing CDAO since 2000. So what do you see in Ling Sherping? Mostly fives, a few fours, but one three. We're not all perfect at everything. And standard nine is one of the faculty areas of faculty skills. So what it does is it recognizes that we need to do a better job preparing our faculty. Uh, Turku has been a, a participant since, 19, uh, since 2006, meaning when we took the data, they'd been working maybe three and a half or so years. And you can see they're sort of a mixture of twos, threes, and some fours. And when we took this, Aarhus, uh, Aarhus, how do you say this in the right language? Aarhus, close enough, forgive my, I'm, I'm not even sure what country Aarhus is in. Is it in Denmark? Yes. I'm an American, you know, there's America, then it doesn't really matter. Well, you know, this is typical of somebody who's just started. There's, there's no zeros, but there's a fair number of ones and twos. So you can see pretty clearly how if you really work at this, you know, your, your capability and your maturity of your approach increases from just having started, Aarhus, to reasonably well along the path, uh, Turku, to pretty well along, Lingshirpa. So don't be surprised when you, when, you, when you do your first evaluation if there are ones and twos in predominantly as opposed to fours and fives. And even uh, when we do this uh, evaluation uh, at MIT, one of the other four, original four, I, my recollection is the last time we did it, we gave ourselves two, two standards on which we ranked ourselves at three. So here's what I would recommend you use this process. You need to familiarize participants with the CDIO approach and the standards. And you need to sit around and rate your program. This is, one of the, uh, this is one of the first things you do. How well are we doing now? And where could we improve? And where would the most important improvements be? And try to reach a consensus rather than voting. You know? And, and if, you, if you can't agree, pick the low score. Right? Don't pick the high score. Because if you pick the low score and then you do some work for six months or a year, then you can give yourself the high score and it feels like you've made progress. If you, give, if you give yourself the high score and then you work six months or a year and you're still in the same place, people will say, wow, we didn't make any progress. So it's better to start a little low because then you can watch yourself rise. And you can conduct this self-evaluation either annually or biannually, it's up to you, uh, and use it to make an action plan. That's really the most valuable thing that comes out of this self-evaluation, is, hmm, we really need to do better at active learning. Let's put together a working group to work on active learning. We could do better at using our workspaces. Let's have Jakob come and give us a seminar on the design of workspaces. It's that sort of action plan that helps you improve in the next year. So let me now just start with a, a, a few of the standards in a little more detail. So this one says that you should adopt the principle that product process and system building, CDIO, is the context for engineering education. And I talked about this, this earlier. This is actually numerically number one, but I found a hard one to start with. Because there's a lot of subtlety in this. What's context mean and what does authentic mean? And, what does conceiving and designing and implementing and operating mean? It's, it's actually one of the more integrative and difficult ones.
to, to start with. So I, at least today, I'm just going to skip over this one and go to one which is much more concrete, which is number two. Number two, pretty much black and white. You know, are you setting learning outcomes? Are they consistent with program goals and are they validated by program stakeholders? This is a fairly objective measurement, right? Um, so here is just to, to give you an example is from that document that you have in your hand, the rationale. Setting learning outcomes helps to ensure that students acquire the appropriate foundation for the future. Professional engineering organizations in industry identify key attributes for beginning engineers, both in technical and professional areas. Moreover, many evaluation and accreditation bodies expect engineering programs to identify program outcomes in terms of their graduates' knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So we want them to learn the right thing. This is the way industry teaches us. And this is the way uh, many of our national accreditation systems are structured. Seems like a reasonable reason to do this. Now, I'm not going to read all this. This is the description. And it helps explain in more detail what the, what the, um, the standard meant. Uh, it, it, you can see just by scanning through it, it explains what's in section one of the syllabus, what's in section two of the syllabus, what's in section three of the syllabus, what's in section four of the syllabus, how you can review and validate it with key stakeholders, and so forth. Now, I want you to notice something that's very important. In the actual standard, it actually doesn't say anything about CDIO, and it doesn't say anything about the syllabus. It just says that learning outcomes for personal, interpersonal, system building skills, as well as discipline and knowledge, consistent with stakeholder program goals and validated by program stakeholders. So you could use any taxonomy of learning outcomes, even one that you invented yourself. And as long as it covered the broad range of these four topics, these four high level areas, and it was consistent with program goals, and validated by stakeholders, it would be fine. See, the effective practice, as we've defined in the standards, is actually very general. And then we provide resources to help you satisfy. So if there were, for example, in your nation, like there has been recently adopted in Canada, a different taxonomy, a different list, if you will, and you went about satisfying the things in that list, that would be fine. That would satisfy this, this, uh, this one of the standards. OK. So here is the specialized standard for standard two. Zero, there is no explicit learning outcomes. One, we've understood the need to create them. Two, there's a plan. Three, the program uh, outcomes have been validated. Four, they're aligned and levels of proficiency have been set. Five, they're regularly reviewed. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is now, what we're going to do is we're going to practice self-evaluation, which is why, for those of you who came in late, if you could, if you, you can either form little groups over there, or you can get up and move and sit down with other people from your university or here. But in groups of about four, four, three, five people, I'd like you to take about ten minutes and evaluate your program on this standard. So you have the description and the rationale in the paper in front of you. And I'll leave the rubrics up here on the, on the screen. So let's see, you're the telecommunication program at uh, uh, UPC, University of Politecnico de Barcelona. Right? These two guys. Right? So they've been doing this now, what, three, four years? Three years. So they're going to sit here and they're going to have a conversation. Well, which, where do we think we are on this scale for standard number two, learning outcomes? Right? And these guy, this guy over here is from Zagreb, right? So they're just starting. So he's going to have a discussion with these three people, four people, about where he is in Zagreb on this scale and so forth. And, you know, there's enough time, about 10, 15 minutes, so that everyone can do a little description about their place. No, everyone should be in a group of three or four. 
even if, you're, if, you're, if there are other people from your university, sit with them. If there's no one else from your university, you talk in groups of three or four, and you describe where you are. And there's about five of us who are going to be walking around the room helping. So if you have a question or something, just put up your hand and wave, and one of us will come over. Oops. So this is the, um, the curricular standard um, that we create mutually supportive disciplinary courses. So for, there are, there, you have to unpack the words here. First, there are disciplinary courses. Right, well, that's not hard to satisfy. That's what we tend to all do. The second is that these disciplinary courses are mutually supportive. That is, there's some level of connection or integration that the students are exposed to and made aware of. That's what mutually supportive means. And that these disciplinary courses integrate personal, professional, uh, and product and process and system building skills. That is to say, that within these courses, the students encounter design, communications, ethics, creativity, and so forth. And this is a very deliberate statement uh, I suspect Christina said something like this that uh, in the curriculum discussion this morning, that, that if you don't at least reference all of these skills in the engineering curriculum, but ignore them completely, or ignore them to the ex respect that you say, writing is important, go over to that program over there and they'll teach you to write, then the, stu the message that will come through to the students is that writing is not important. That the, the students are highly motivated, unfortunately, by what happens on the assessment cri criteria. That if, if part of the assessment in one of the subjects is about, includes writing, they'll understand that writing is important. If no assessment any place has anything to do with writing, the message will come through that writing isn't important. So that's basically what this, uh, this particular standard says. And you have in the, out, in the, the materials in your hand, uh, the, the longer description and the rationale for it. So here's the standard number three, again, following the same template. There's no integration of skills. The need for the integration of skills is necessary, is recognized. A curriculum plan that integrates disciplinary learning, personal, interpersonal, product process, system building skills is approved that approved, right? That means that whatever group or committee that you need to have approved is, has approved it. That you've integrated into one or more years. Number four is that it's fully integrated. And number five is that it's regularly reviewed. That is to say, integrated and regularly re reviewed. Okay? So take a few minutes to discuss in your group where you think you stand on this one. We'll do the same thing. We'll call for a few volunteers to report and uh, see where we are. So, integrated curriculum. Oh, you almost got it again. Not anymore. <laughs> I once bought a painting that way, you know? <laughs> okay, who'd like to volunteer? Ah. Oh, okay. Okay, we are from the Technical University of Catalonia in Barcelona, and we had the opportunity uh, four years ago of redefining the, our curricula from the scratch the, due to the adaptation of the Bologna process and mapped the, 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 the syllabus to the, the list of skills of our university and defined uh, the, the skills at three levels and uh, assigned two skills to every subject in the, in the curricula and uh, every subject uh, has the, the, let's say, the, the duty of introducing uh, uh, learning activities and assessing activities to, to, to demonstrate that the, those uh, two, uh, at least, uh, skills uh, are, are promoted. Uh, of course, they can contribute to, to additional skills if they want. And in order to, 
to make a, a let's say a, a possible approach, we just ask the, the, the subjects uh, to introduce to uh, learning activities every year and uh, consolidate them. So no, not, not, a, not, not a, uh, a complete redesign of the subjects, but including just uh, two different uh, activities to, to, to enter slowly year by year in the, in the introduction of, yeah. of the skills in, the, you know, in all, in all the, the program. Thank you. Okay. This is actually a very good point that um, has been raised. By the way, in this era of modern communication and networking, I have to tell you that while you were speaking, I got a text from a student of mine at MIT who's from this university telling me that there's another student from this university who wants to come to MIT and one of these guys is going to talk to me, right? We're all so networked, it's unbelievable. That's the good news, right? The bad news is you can never go on holiday. <laughs> Except in Sweden or Scandinavia where you just turn them all off for July, right? I think you do that, don't you, if you're smart. <laughs> I haven't learned to do that yet. So uh, personal skills. this is personal <laughs> skill. Yes, I, I'm failing this one. I'm a zero. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, 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 a very good point was raised is that when you're designing this integrated curriculum, you have to sort of strike a balance. In fact, I had another question from Calgary back there that, that sort of hinged on this earlier today, is you can, you can integrate too much. You know, you can integrate, you can spread things around too much. And the reason is as follows, you know, uh, actually in the book there's an interesting example from Lingshirping University where they have basically a, su a, a subject in the first year, a subject in the third year, and a subject in the fourth year, and I think the fourth year one is both semesters if I remember. And most of the CDIO activities are integrated into those, if you count them as three or four subjects. At, at MIT, when we did the original design, we sort of went to the other end of the spectrum. And we said, every subject is going to have some role in this, in, the CD, in CDIO, teaching CDIO uh, learning outcomes. You know, so this course will teach this, and this course will teach this, and this course will teach this. Well, after a few years, it was okay at the design phase. And after a few years, the system started to break down a little bit because a new instructor comes into the course and he or she wants to change it some. And very soon you notice that that, that special topic that had been put in there sort of had disappeared. So I think this, this approach that you suggest, which is you may have three or four courses someplace in the curriculum that really carry most of the integrated learning and then in, in some of the other ones, you have one or two discrete topics that you can keep track of easily and that everybody knows that when it goes from me teaching it to you teaching it, that has to sort of stay in. And, and that seems like a manageable system. And where it gets very difficult, which for many of us is a reality, is when we have courses in our program that other people teach. So let's say there's an advanced mathematics course or a, a materials course that's taught by a materials department or an, an applied math course in a computer science department. It's very difficult to influence all of those, those things that are sort of at a little bit of a distance. You had this, this issue at uh, KTH, I remember, early, uh, Christina, didn't you? you did, I can't remember how you resolved it, but I remember us talking about it long ago, that there were a lot of subjects that were not taught by the transportation program and it was hard to, to influence them. In the beginning, it spanned over 17 departments. Yeah. Right. So you have to be realistic in the extent in which you can integrate the curriculum. Integration does not mean every course that the students take in four years. The, the idea is to, is to make it visible to them that, uh, that these things work together and that the skills are important to them. And in fact, sometimes it's very effective if you just let two professors work together. You know, it's uh, that the students have the perception 
that uh, at the end of each course, that's the end of that learning. You know, when they take the last exam, it's over. And, and the more you can have your, your teachers uh, reference the previous course or work together with the people, or even if they're in parallel, if you have two courses in parallel that are somewhat related, to try and bring them together at the end of the term, at the end of the semester, even if it's just for one project, just to get the students the feel. Well, it's been a long day. I had one more of these queued up. I'll just show it to you, which is a really easy one. It's the introductory subject, the introductory course that provides a framework for engineering education and introducing building skills. So this is really a very discrete thing, and you should be able to almost look at this by now and say, do you have no introductory course? Has the need for an introductory course? Has there been a plan for an introductory course? Uh, is there an introductory course been, been introduced? Is there documented evidence that have achieved the intended learning outcomes? Is it being periodically reviewed? You see, there's the same pattern to each of these. So by now, on this very discrete one, you should almost be able to look at it and say, well, we're about a two, or we're about a four. And then the next question that I want to really emphasize is, so then, then how would you improve? You know, what would be the steps you would take in the next year to move towards the top of the scale? And we should feel like we're continuously improving. And it will happen that you'll have setbacks. You know, you'll evaluate yourself one year and you'll give yourself a three or a four. And then the next year you'll do it and you'll get a three. You know, life is not monotonically improving in the world. If you have some key professor who taught some important module and then maybe the next year you have a more junior person or a person who cares less about learning because they're more busy with other things, sometimes you can go down. You know, and those are the most important things to catch in the self-evaluation. You're losing ground. You know, what can we do to improve that again next year? So let, I think I just have one or two final charts here. Just all of the standards. Um, this is a chart that's in several of the papers. In fact, there's a good paper by Perry Armstrong and uh, Rob Niewanner that is in the CDOI kits. But it says, oh, before I do this, there was one other interesting question that I got from a Scandinavian group, a group with a Dane and two Norwegians back here, uh, which, is Johan in the room? Uh, it, the question is, what's the relationship between the standards or the syllabus and uh, the EQF, the European Qualification Framework? Uh, and the answer is, I don't know because I don't speak European, but ask, ask Johan. But last year, or for two years actually, the uh, Erasmus Mundus program funded a project that involved Politecnico Milan, Chalmers, MIT, Barcelona, and a few other uh, stakeholders to, to rationalize how the EQF would apply to engineering programs and particularly uh, to the relationship to CDAO. And that report must be someplace, Johan. I'm not sure it's on the web, is it? I, I, Is a paper. Uh huh. But we wrote a paper for the meeting last year. So, on the web. Yeah. So it, there should at least be a paper on the website, and it will reference a report which you could get from Johan if you can't find it elsewhere. Do you want to say anything about whether CDIO helps you make EQF easier or more difficult, or is it not that simple? It's not that simple. <laughs> Most European processes, you just say it's not that simple. <laughs> um, so this is just a little bit of a map that one of our colleagues drew that, you know, you start with the CDAO principle, and you, on this right-hand side is the what questions, what do we want our students to learn, and the center of that is the syllabus with the stakeholder surveys and the accreditation criteria, criteria and the benchmarking loop. And on the left-hand side is really the standards two, uh, three to 12, which is knowing what best practice is and the standards are, 
how do you go about redesigning the program, and there are benchmarking steps in there as well. Well, I think that about does it. The, the value of using the standards is they provide guidance in program design, periodic self-evaluation, and I help you identify how to improve. They facilitate discussion and sharing. Um, as of a decision by the council in December 2010, we have now are going to ask all new programs to joining CDO, either as part of the application process or within six months of joining, to do the first uh, self-evaluation, to sort of set, the, set, the, bent, set the, uh, the ground level so that you can see the improvement from, from where you begin. And then about every three years, we ask all the collaborators to do it again, just to collect evidence about how well we're doing. And it's voluntary, like everything in CDO, but most programs do it. Uh, and I believe that we're about at that level. I think 2008 was, I think we did in 05 and 08. So I suspect in the next year or so, we'll do that again to collect the next round of evidence with the new rubrics uh, that we've just developed. So, well, it's been a long day here, and there's still more to come. We have, um, I've forgotten, the academy, and then the speed dating, and then food, and uh, all sorts of activities for the rest of the day. So thank you all. We'll be around if you have any individual questions. And we'll see you tomorrow, yeah. except that Johan has something to say. Yeah. And uh, really, it's a message from uh, Dean Martin. And he wants to uh, get everyone in, uh, in the right place for the upcoming activities. So at 5 o'clock, there is a CDIO Academy. So then you can go to your left and down to the sports hall. That's uh, the first stop. And uh, Dean Martin hopes that everyone can make it there on exactly the right time. But of course, there's a lot of things to do there, including um, putting uh, markers on, on good projects and so forth. And then at 6 o'clock, there is the speed dating, which takes place on the, on the lawn outside the, the sports hall. So um, then, then that's the next stop and the next thing you we hope that you can be on, on time. So, uh, and then after that is dinner. And after that, then is dinner, and you can. And then you have to catch the bus. <laughs> <laughs>